Katrina, thank you so much for for coming on. And it's uh, it's actually great to reminisce with someone over in Adelaide. Uh, so thank you for so much for for coming on and doing this. Oh, it's wonderful to hear that you've spent time in uh, the my beautiful birth city of Adelaide. And look, it's been raining all day today because winter is coming, but the sun is out right now. And um, I love Adelaide, as you would appreciate. You get you get to experience all seasons. You know, like the seasons, you get it really cold, you get it hot, and uh, it's certainly a great place to be. I actually actually didn't ask you which uh, which footy team do you support? Oh, I'm an I'm actually an ambassador for the Adelaide Crows uh, football team, and uh, so I do, yeah I do support them. Uh, but I also I mean I, being Adelaide as you'd appreciate, or some people wouldn't, but I, I do barrack for Port Adelaide as well. Um, it's nice to see another South Australian yeah. team doing so well. But yeah, the Crows are my uh, my number one team. I I got I got branded with a crows jersey as soon as i got there like sort of friend of mine just gave me a crows jersey. right you're you're an adopted crows fan now because they're all crows fans so straight away you're a crows fan there is a for people that are listening there's a hot rivalry between port power and, and adelaide crows in um in adelaide because there's two teams in the in the city so yeah i had to bring that up i had to find out what that was which one you were at <laughs> But look, um, for for I, I want to actually just dive straight into your upbringing. I want to dive into your discovery of cerebral palsy as a youngster, and then really your upbringing. So I guess really just start that story where mm. it ever starts for you, and 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 yeah, I guess take it away. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. Yeah, you know, as you've already said, and I've said, I'm, I'm born in Adelaide, and. Uh, speaking of Port Adelaide, my father actually played for another South Australian team called North Adelaide and they were huge rivals in the 70s and my dad was a very successful football player um, in, in South Australia and I know you've also interviewed one of my cousins who's on my mum's side of the family, Rachel Spawn, who's a triple Olympic basketballer and so growing up for me, sport was, um, wasn't was a thing you got to choose to do, it was compulsory in my household and uh, look love doing sport um you know it was something that was fantastic to do and for me as a young kid um grow up in a you know really um yeah just family life my sister was 14 months older did everything normally as you know kids do my cerebral palsy story is an interesting one I actually didn't know I had cerebral palsy until I was 18 well let's say it was called cerebral palsy until I was 18 uh, when I was three years old, uh, my mum and dad noticed that I was limping when I got tired and it wasn't going away. So I went off to see a doctor and then, to a, and then went on to see a specialist in the year of 1980. Uh, and in that year, it was picked up that I had suffered a very mild injury to my brain, uh, you know, in utero, like while I was developing and that the right side of my body was affected. So that is, in fact, cerebral palsy. They didn't use the term cerebral palsy back then, um, and so it was more seeing it as a very mild injury to my brain um, as I was developing. So the right side of my body was affected, and that explained why I was limping. And from that point in time, so age three, they uh, the specialist sent me off to a physio, and I had to get a night plaster fitted, and then I had to wear this night plaster on my right leg every night until I stopped growing. Now, I know you can't tell height of people in Zoom, and I must say I'm finding this fascinating now because I've been on a few different leadership committees, one in particular for Commonwealth Games, which I will be in Birmingham uh, this July, August, which I'm incredibly excited to oh, come wow. your way. And we've had to have all our leadership meetings on Zoom, and then finally a, a few weeks ago we were able to meet in person. And it's like, oh, you're a bit shorter than I thought you were. <laughs> you're a bit taller than I thought you were. So uh, that's something probably everyone's enjoying and doing again when we get to meet our teams. But you can't tell how tall I am. I'm, I'm just under six foot, so I am quite tall. And uh, oh, wow. so I had to wear that night plaster to bed until I stopped growing, which from age three I worked out it was three and a half thousand nights, so quite a long time. And as a, as a young kid, I, I didn't like wearing that plaster. In fact, I hated it. And, you know, I suppose it's not very comfortable to wear, but the thing I didn't like about it is that it made me different and I didn't want to be different. And as I started to go to school, I saw other kids wearing plaster to school, but they were wearing plaster because, you know, probably like some of your um, viewers or listeners, they, they're probably wearing it because they broke something. They broke their arm or the leg. And our minds are incredibly um, powerful. My little young five-year-old mind said to me, well, I have to wear a plaster 
every night. So I must be broken. And when you say I've learned now, when you say you're broken or there's something wrong with me, um, it actually comes with a feeling of shame. And I remember feeling this, didn't know it was shame when I was a young kid and didn't like that feeling. So I thought, how could I get rid of it? Um, I'll go home and I'll tell my parents that I won't wear my plaster when a friend comes to stay. And I even went a step further and said to my parents, can we not tell anybody that there's something different about me? There's something wrong with me. Can we keep it our secret? Um, It is hard to see my cerebral palsy. People don't see it day to day with me walking around unless you know what to look for. Um, And interesting, when we look at disability in Australia, 4.4 million people have a disability. And in fact, 90% is hidden. And so for me as a young child, you know, I just wanted to be like everybody else. I suppose I saw how kids at school were treated if they were too tall or too short or their skin was a different colour or, you know, like being different wasn't a great place to be in 1980 when I was going to school. So I, you know, I wanted to be like everybody else. So once my parents said that they, we could keep it a secret, I went about working incredibly hard to show people I was good enough, in fact, you know, that I was excellent. And, it, you know, it paid off. I was always good in, in schoolwork and I was always good at sport. It was, you know, helpful that I was born into that sporting family. I didn't do the, you know, the, the amount that was required. I remember doing extra than everybody else because my body could do it. I had to learn the way that I could do it. And once I spent time practicing things, I got better than everybody else, which was, which was super exciting. Um, and made my way up through the netball ranks. I loved playing netball, loved playing team sports. And I found myself um, winning a scholarship at the Australian Institute of Sport in 1995 in Canberra on a fully able-bodied netball scholarship, which was incredibly exciting. Uh, However, that was the year when I turned 18 and that's where I found out I actually had cerebral palsy. So, so that's kind of you know the the version of my, the short version of my my youth and growing up. <laughs> so when you were eighteen, there did you when you get told you've got cerebral palsy, was there a mindset shift in yourself? Did you feel a bit of a difference because you've grown up there, you've got an able bodied scholarship? You're I'm assuming you're telling yourself able-bodied and it's, and it's actually similar to my story like I was telling myself I'm able-bodied I'm I'm, well, I'm the same as everyone else I'm the same as everyone else but then when you was there like a level of self-acceptance of it or what did, what did you did you push back from it what mm-hmm. what was your mindset around that that time yeah it's a really great question because you know, I was 18 at this point, you know, you're still really trying to work out who you are and then combine that with the fact that I'm trying to hide something about myself to, you know, to be able like you when you talk about your story. And look, 1995 didn't go to plan for me as a netballer. I, I'd never been injured before and we, we do, were doing a lot of court time and I developed a significant knee injury on my right side, which had me sidelined for 10 weeks. So that was the first thing that happened, which wasn't helpful. Uh, I then got um, over my injury and got back on the court and we had 12 girls in our squad and only 10 would ever travel interstate or overseas. And I would, you know, be one of those two girls that would miss out. So I'd go back each week and try that a bit harder and hope that I'd get in because hard work was my only skill. Um, I couldn't do anything back then. I couldn't change my body. I could just try and work harder. And I I never got picked in that team again. So that sucked. Um, I found that really hard because, you know, my heart, my mind wanted to be the best netballer I could be and I couldn't change the right side of my body. Um, So I was dealing with those two things. And then I got, you know, it was discovered that I had cerebral palsy. It was actually a coach who was training a squad of people, uh, athletes to go to the next Paralympic Games in Atlanta in the sport of athletics. He saw me walk one day around the AIS and he noticed my cerebral palsy straight away because that's what he's trained to look for. And so he came up to me and we did a few tests. And when it was confirmed what I had, I remember he came up to me on this day. Can you imagine how excited he was? Because he's like, wow. You know, back in 1995, there wasn't talent search for the Paralympic Games. And athletes like me who had a disability, we were, if you could, we were trying to hide it. And if you were a good athlete, you were embedded somewhere in the able-bodied system and doing well. You know, for me, it was that point in time where, I'd gotten to the highest level in netball in Australia, which was amazing. And the fact that I wasn't going to be good enough to that next level 
to then have this coach discover me and tell me I had cerebral palsy uh, was a very interesting moment in my life because I remember him coming up to me and saying, look, if you get classified, which is a process to get into the Paralympic Games, and then if you could qualify, and he wanted me to go to the sport of track and field because that was his sport. He said to me, you could come to the Paralympic Games with us in a year t- in a year's time. And I remember hearing that thinking, wow, you've just said I could go to a Paralympic Games, which means that people know that I'm a Paralympian. And I then thought to myself, well, people know that there's something different about me and I don't like that part about myself. So my initial reaction wasn't anything to do with the Paralympic Games. It was actually knowing that people would know there's something wrong with me and I didn't know how to uh, love and accept that part of me. It was something that I was, you know, really trying hard to hide. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy when he he first said that to me. Um, I didn't really know what to do. Isn't it interesting, though, that your first reaction, you know, our, our minds will want to protect us of threat and danger, and that's exactly what mm. mine did. It went, oh, people, you know, you might not fit in, you might not be liked, um, you're going to be exposed. What happens if you fail or make a mistake? Mm. Uh, luckily, um, this coach is incredibly genuine, enthusiastic and passionate, and he suggested to me that I go and speak to someone about making this decision because it was a big decision to make. And he said, why don't you go and speak to the sports psychologist about it and talk it through and then make a, you know, a really good decision. And, Lewis, that's exactly what I did. It was the best piece of advice I, I could have been given in that point of time because I don't know if I didn't have someone to talk it through. I might have just got stuck with my negative thinking and said no to it because the thought about being exposed and not fitting in and failing and making a mistake you know, was incredibly strong. Um, so to have that moment for me to sit down with a sports psychologist to actually think about my thinking, which now I know is a process called metacognition and is a really important process when we take the time to think about our thinking, it, it changed everything for me. It's such an interesting topic as well for, for young women. I don't think even with your your whole scenario that you were going through there, hiding it, there's so much of what you were going through there that is got rife now in the world. I don't know I, I don't know what your views are on this and it's this incredible need to fit in to to be accepted and the the fear of if I really show people who I am that I'm not going to be accepted. I'm not going to be loved and it's something that you you have to find that way of that this level of self acceptance and accept where I'm at right now, what I am, and everything that's great about me. But the world will tell you so many different things of not what to be, but you have to be strong in that. Was there something that you then started to tell yourself that allowed mm. you to gather this level of self acceptance? Yeah, it was probably still in that moment of you know sitting down with the psychologist and uh, and I often say to people when this when the coach said to me, why don't you go and speak to the sports psychologist? I said yes straight away. It was such an easy thing for me to say yes to because I'd had a psychologist in my team since I was fourteen, and you'd appreciate we have the South Australian Sports Institute here. As a young netballer, I had access to psychologists to help me to mentally perform. So. I knew psychologists were a really crucial part. I still see a psychologist now. I still see a psychologist to challenge my mental performance and to really help me get the best out of life. It's it's a must for me, a really important skill. Um, so in that moment when I wrote down all of the negatives, which I've already mentioned, yeah, fitting in, not being liked, failing, making mistakes, when this psychologist said, okay, let's just park those thoughts there. You know, they're your thoughts, but they're not completely you. You can actually just leave them there and step out of them and, and let's let's go to the positives and let's see what, if you say yes to this, what could you find? And when I did that, it was an extraordinary moment for me because as I started to list them, like represent my country, travel, I'd never been out of Australia and the next games were Atlanta, I could still play sport, I love sport, I could still challenge myself and um, if I went to the sport of track and field, which I did, if I ran a time, I was in the team and no one could tell me I wasn't good enough anymore. You know, that that for me, I could achieve how much I wanted to. Um, I started to see something really special that exactly what I hoped to achieve by going to the Australian Institute of Sport, my values and goals were in front of me. What was different was the packaging. And for me, that was 
it's such an extraordinary moment because when you what I've learned from that is when you have clarity over goals also aligned to your values and you anchor in them the packaging doesn't matter like in fact you 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 can be open to packaging that maybe you didn't even know that it could exist and for me that moment I remember thinking wow this is where I need to go the Paralympics is exactly what I need to do this is where I'm meant to be I do remember asking myself this big question at age 18. I remember saying to myself, why do I hate being different so much? And why do I hate it? And why did I ask myself that question? Because at 18, I was already exhausted. And Lewis, you would get this. I was already exhausted of trying to cover up this thing that was different about me. So if people noticed I was limping, which I do when I get tired because my right leg is shorter than than my left, not too much, but enough. And I also limp. My brain gets tired. I will limp. If you'd asked me, Lewis, I'd tell you my knee was sore. Then I'd had to remember to to tell you later on that it got better. (laughs) And I would use all of my great cognitive energy on trying to hide this thing I didn't like about myself. And I remember saying to myself, what am I doing this? Because this is exhausting. I don't I don't want to live like this. If I go to the Paralympics, I could be the best Paralympian I choose to be. And if I go to a Paralympics, it comes with a label and I want to own that label. I want to be an incredibly proud Paralympian, which meant I had to learn to accept and love all of myself. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have those tools in my kit. I I knew it was the right thing to do. And for some reason, I, I thought of young kids with cerebral palsy like me and thought if one day they could see me and go, wow, she's got what I, I've got and she's achieved that, that I was in. You know, I, I love to help people more than I do winning gold medals. <laughs> and so when I could see that I could help people and be a good athlete, I, I knew it was where my life was meant to take me. That's such a, a profound question that you asked yourself, this why do I hate being different? And I think whether people are consciously saying that question to themselves that is essentially the antithesis of trying to fit in isn't it it's the underlying question of i hate where i'm at right now i want to be over there i want to be right where these guys are because they're but and it's something that weirdly uh, i don't think it's weird it's not weirdly actually it is not a coincidence that all of the high level athletes whether it's olympians professionals national international any any athlete or even the the psychologists the coaches that have been on this podcast they have the the most common theme that i can think of is that they have embraced who they are they've embraced that they stand out differently from the crowd and then once that has happened it has opened up a yeah. pandora's box of opportunities and and like it is it is the easily the most simple and common thing that they say but it's it's not a simple answer it's not a simple process to get there like it seems like it should be such a simple thing I can just accept myself but it's in the little idiosyncrasies within the world where you mentioned there like I'm trying to that that was such a tangible thing that you were doing where you're trying to tell someone about your limp and oh now I've got to remind them it's like well as soon as you let go of that and, and yeah. a, just that simple thing it relieves that pressure it relieves that and and yeah did, so from your from your then motivation and goals towards your dreams and aspirations because I'm assuming you, you then started to dream up try gold medals and this is what I want to go towards did you feel a a sense of freedom in your training did did, did things change what was what was that real shift there for you leading into Olympics yeah Look, at the first year happened so quickly, Lewis. You know, I went from being an able-bodied netballer in 1995 to then finding out I could be a para-athlete and then deciding that I would, you know, try out. You know, firstly, I had to be good enough. I had to make the team. I had to get classified, which I did. And, and you know, I, I do have cerebral palsy. I have enough of cerebral palsy because there is a cutoff line. And then they classified me to be a, a track or T38, which is the mildest of all the cerebral palsies groups in athletics. And then I had to make sure I could run fast enough. I did go to the sport of athletics, which was seemed the most simple transition 
I know the wheelchair basketball team were keen to get hold of me because I was a really good netballer, right? And I can play wheelchair basketball. Um, I would be, you know, a, a very functional player. But say for me, swimming was incredibly difficult. It wasn't a great transition. And we had an athletics coach in our netball team. So for me, it was, it was a relatively... I wouldn't say easy, but I had a year to prepare for Atlanta and it happened so quickly. I came back to Adelaide and got an athletic squad and and so that happened, you know, so fast that, you know, I did go to Atlanta in 96 and came back with two gold and a silver medal, which was so fast and so quick. And, you know, it was the first time in my career I got to compete against women like myself. And I'd been training for... So that point, probably 10 years against able-bodied peers. And to get to that point where I was on a level playing field and win and, and get second place was so extraordinary. Um, and it was there was relief to go, oh, like it has, actually doesn't have to be that hard. Like there are other people like me out there. Um, and I, I loved everything about the Paral. I loved everything about the Paralympic movement. And the first my first games were in 96, so I was successful up front. Um, at the same time, Paralympic sport was growing immensely, like every year it's grown immensely and countries are rewarding athletes with money for medals. And so my career ended up being that I won. It, it took me eight years to get back to a gold medal level again. So people kind of think, oh, Katrina just come from the able world and she comes and win, wins gold. Yes, I did. It took me eight years to get back to it. Like I won silver for eight years at every event I went to between Atlanta and Athens. And even now the times that were run in Tokyo last year are times that I would never have got close to because now athletes are able to run full time. They're earning great money and it's a full time mm. profession, which I never I never was able to do. I always had to work or study and be an athlete. So it was all it all happened so quickly initially. What I did learn though when I didn't win gold for eight years that's where most of my learning happened um I won silver in Sydney and bronze in Sydney and actually didn't run any personal bests and I felt like I you know I I was very happy and had gratitude for silver and bronze but you would understand this and people that come from sport you have four years between events you the only thing you want to do is run a personal best and so even for me I, I just felt like you know, I didn't quite get things together in Sydney. Um, so, so many learnings along that journey really helped me to become a great track and field athlete. And after about 10 years of running, I remember a very well and respected coach in Adelaide said to me, Katrina, you actually look like a runner now. <laughs> like it actually took me. <laughs> um, running might look simple to people, but it is very technical. And it actually took me 10 years, probably like most things where you master it in 10 years, that 10,000 hour rule, where I actually um, looked like a, a very good runner. That that period in between golds was was something I wrote down, which was kind of really fascinating because I heard you say you got really good at getting second. Yeah. You got really good at getting second. And, and that's, was there, was it purely physical? Or was there a, a mindset or a mental thing that block that was happening in, in that period? What, what was, what did you find out in that and learn about yourself in that eight, eight year period? Yeah, look, the biggest learning came out of Sydney actually, because I, I actually did felt like um, did feel like I'd failed, and I sat down with my sports psychologist afterwards to really unpack the feelings I had. And she said, look, let's have a look at your build up to Sydney. And it was incredible. We wrote down everything that I was doing and I was doing an extraordinary amount of things. Like I was studying my final year of physiotherapy and I didn't go half time. I thought I could be superwoman and do it full time with my peers. I was training 35 hours a week. My parents live an hour out of Adelaide, so I've always lived out of home. So I had to cook and clean. I had a part time job. I'd said yes to every charity, community board or like anything I could do to help people. I was a really good time manager. I was great working with quantity, but it wasn't quality. And when she looked at my value set, which is, you know, I wanted to be known for excellence and yet I wasn't achieving personal best and excellence. What I learned in that situation is I had spread myself so thin by trying to do everything that my psychologist said to me, Katrina, you'll never get back to a gold medal level. If you're happy with silver, keep doing things as you are. But if you want to get back to gold, you need to make some serious 
you know, you need to put some serious boundaries in place. You need to learn to, you know, declutter and um, and do the stuff that matters. And it has to be um, quality. You need to, you know, not quantity. You need to actually find the time to do all the stuff that matters. So the big learning for me in that was actually learning to say no. Uh, my two other values or strengths are love and kindness. And I, you know, all of our strengths to an extreme without boundaries become your weakness. So for me, I had to learn to say no with love and kindness because that's how I say no. Um, I hadn't found a way to say no in a way that resonated with me because I felt like I was letting people down if I said didn't say yes. So once I found the right language to tell people that I couldn't help them or maybe down the track I could and I found the time to do the train, like all the extra training you know, and, and every training session to be quality, that's when things significantly changed. That, that You've mentioned it now a couple of times, values, and you mentioned it early on. And you, forgive me if I'm wrong, but you you said you'd set down your values quite early on at a young age. That's quite a rare thing to do. That's yeah. quite a that's quite a unique yeah. thing to do. I don't think many people do that. Yeah. Well, I didn't actually. I didn't. I couldn't have told you as 18 that these are my values. But what happened was when I wrote my goal because they were wrapped up in goals, right? Now I know the difference. Mm. Um, what happened though when I put that down in paper? I can use that term value now, but as a young 18-year-old, I started to see what I wanted to get out of life, which for me now is the word value and, and goals. And that I, I knew back then that excellence was important to me, probably excellence and making a difference. I could tell you back at 18 that they were my, my um, things I really enjoyed doing. I didn't know that they were cool values back then. I, I now know. But they were guiding me. They were helping to guide me even way back, even younger than that. They were my guiding, they were my, that were my compass and my guiding principles. And as I've unpacked my values, you know, more recently, I can now see my values in action all the way through my childhood. And so when they weren't happening in action, like when I wasn't winning gold, it's that, what do they call it? The cognitive dissonance when you have values, but you're react, you know, you're acting, you know, in a, in a different way to your values, you feel that dissonance which can lead to a lot of stress. And that's what I felt after Sydney, that I wanted to be known for excellence yet I couldn't get to it because I was trying to help too many people. So there was this lovely value clash happening that I really needed to make sure I unpacked and, and did well after that. Do you think it, and this is a very retrospective question, I, I don't really enjoy asking these sorts of questions of, of athletes, is do you think if you had those values as a conscious um a phrase or, or, or literally having them written down and, and, and a real conscious understanding of them early on that it would have made a difference that it would have made some sort of areas of your life easier to to manage or even make decisions easier to to make yeah it's a good question look I know they were guiding me so I could I could feel their guidance probably what was lacking for me was how to to find their optimal use. And I know when I teach, you know, well-being resilience skills now, we tell we 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 have values or strengths like on a dial and we can overplay them and then we can underplay them. And when we underplay them, we're not being our authentic selves and we're de-energized and you know we're not feeling our best. When we overplay them, um, it can lead to trouble as well. So it's finding that right level of using your values. So that guidance would have been helpful for me. And I suppose I had to find, you know, through our failures, which people say to me, um, how do you manage those? And when I look back now, I the, the lessons I got from not winning gold in Sydney actually became the pathway for me to get back to gold. So I often go, well, if I didn't have that experience in Sydney by overplaying my values, would I have got back to a gold medal level? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's an interesting situation. I, I, the only reason I ask is because I, I work with young athletes where I, I try to align themselves with ultimately who they want to be. And that's yeah. really this, this question. So I have a young man that I'm working with and he is a a good good rugby player he's he's striving to become good he struggles controlling his emotions and especially around school he's he's had times where he's not controlled his emotions well and he 
understands that that's what he wants to do. He wants to control his emotions. Yeah. So one of the questions I just literally posed to him is when you are about to fly off the handle, when you are about to go into this emotional state, ask yourself, who do you want to be right now? And I've even asked, I'm asking his teachers at school to ask him that question rather than for them to react emotionally. Like, can you ask him, how, who do you want to be right now? Because the answer of that question is very rarely do I want to be this angry person in this situation. The person I actually want to do is I want to be this. And that creates that cognitive distance. It allows you to remember who you want to be. Who, where, where can I connect with myself? Can I connect with my values? And okay, I, maybe the situation is going to require me to go, do you know what? I'm just going to calm down, sit down. And it, it might be disconnection from the moment because it might be what you need. It might be asking a question. It might be... But very rarely is it going to be, I want to be the aggressor. I want to be this highly emotional. I want to go mad and, and, and crazy in this situation. Just by simply asking a question that doesn't have a yes or no answer, it's actually, no, tell me who you want to be. Who do you genuinely want to be? And I, and I think that underlying who your values is for a young person and understanding just, because I think values, the word values can be thrown around. So just wrapping it up in, who do you want yeah. to be? Like, what what type of person do you want to be known for? If someone's going to talk about you and describe you, what do you want them to say about you? What are the things? Okay, if those are certain behaviors, then you can probably figure out what a value that is, that type of characteristic that's going to be. And it's amazing that you were able to to do that at a at what such a pivotal moment as well. An eighteen year old woman like that is that is a very highly emotional period of your life and. And and I, I I can imagine that was a a very challenging period, but mm -hmm. amazing that you did that that so yeah. yeah. Oh, and Lewis, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, if I'm speaking to young athletes and if I'm training wellbeing, resilient skills to adults or in businesses, that's the first thing I start with as well is around priorities and you know what what are your very important priorities and what do you want to be known for? And when it's your retirement party, what do you want people to say about you and your next significant birthday? Um, and it is, it is hard. I mean, for me as a young, I suppose because I have clarity on mine now, I can see that they were right there from the beginning and they were guiding me to have clarity on them earlier, absolutely, um, and to have someone like you asking me those questions in those difficult moments. And maybe that's what the psychologists were doing to really help me navigate mm making those decisions um you know for me i still i still um use my values every day to really guide my my performance and one example that i if i know that if i don't have the checks and balances i have in place now that i work hard to have in place i know that my natural default will go back to saying yes to lots of things because it's probably you know really I, I love helping people so I have to have <laughs> I have to have balances and checks in place to keep me from not spreading myself too thin and and um, I really love the work of Brene Brown um, and you probably mm. um, I'm sure you do too Lewis and one of the one some of her work and one of the quotes that I really love sharing with people is um, I suppose as someone that loves to help people, um, I want to be known for being compassionate. So being able to see when someone's suffering, but also having that desire to want to help them in, in suffering. I'm a physiotherapist by degree, and I suppose that's what we're trained to do. People come to us to, and tell us what's going on. We're, we've learned to critically think and diagnose and help to put people on their journeys. Um, so, you know, I, I have that compassion. I've, I've had it from a young age as well. Um, she did research to really look at who are the most compassionate people out there. And I suppose there is this myth or belief that the most compassionate people are, are selfless and they, they serve everyone else before themselves. Um, I certainly had that one at some point in my career. And in fact, her research showed the opposite, that she found that the most compassionate people ask for what they need. So they know what they need. When they say yes, they, they mean it. And when they say no, um, you know, they're able to say no. Um, they're compassionate because their boundaries keep them out of resentment. And I know when I ask myself that question, do I want to be known for being resentful or do I want to be known for being compassionate? Because sometimes I'll be driving to something, I won't say what it is, but I'll be driving along and I can feel resentment in me going, I don't want to be going to this meeting or why did I say yes to this? And 
I want to point my finger and blame someone else. And one of my great teachers um, in Nepal, I normally spend a lot of time in Nepal, Kathmandu, and, you know, that Buddhist principle is that when you go to point your finger at someone, there's three pointing back at you. And so when I'm in resentment, I go, oh, actually, interesting, there's three back at me. Where did I not put a boundary in place? Where did I say yes and I didn't mean to? Because if I don't put that boundary, how can I be compassionate if I don't really want to attend things? So uh, it's a re- that's how, you know, that really has helped me to still uh, live and work according to some really important values to me. You, you being a physiotherapist and training in that, do you think that was because of an a, a, a interest in your condition that led you down that road? I think it was two things. Uh, as a young kid, I I can or I can still feel what I felt in my heart as a young kid to want to help people. I mm. I was babysitting at a young age that I don't think we'd let our kids babysit now. <laughs> I, mean, I think we we let we I mean, make sure our kids a bit older. I remember in tragedy some you know some tragic accidents that happened to some family friends. As eleven year old, I could sit in people's grief and ask the questions adults couldn't. I don't know, I had this innate ability to want to uh, help people and have that compassion. I then also probably what drove me to be a physio is having that, um, you know, having cerebral palsy. I often see my body as my left side is completely able. Like I can I understand what it feels like to be able-bodied because my left side is that. Where my right side, it's a bit like yin and yang, my right side for me feels different yet it's my whole self and I was born like this so I don't know any different. So I can't, I can't, if this was my right foot, I actually can't curl my toes at all. Mm. So the, to not be able to do something, even though I can do it really easily on my left side, I find that fascinating still at age 45 that I can do it so easily on one side and I can't do it on the other. And I thought, wow, imagine if I could take that skill set, you know, Having cerebral palsy has taught me so many wonderful skills that others wouldn't have. You know, I have incredible empathy and compassion because of having cerebral palsy. I can see beauty and difference in others that others can't see because of my cerebral palsy. I'm a great problem solver because of my cerebral palsy. So I think you're right, yes, because of my condition. I had these skill sets that others didn't have and I'm incredibly grateful that my right upper limb works better than my right lower limb so you might see people with cerebral palsy you'll notice it more because the upper limb is affected where for me I can you know I can still be a great physio not that I choose to be one um um, but yeah it really did lead my decisions of um of becoming one even though I only work week one weekend a month now to stay registered I feel like I work as a physio every day. I just don't like fixing body parts. I really like to use all of my story, my whole self, um, out in the community to help people, um, you know, be well. Yeah, that that's something that the reason I ask is because I, I don't think it's a coincidence that people that have whether it's an injury early on in their life and they are fully able-bodied or if it's someone that has been born with a condition, that level of physical awareness that happens in the body and especially when you mature, like I was very similar. I didn't probably have the awareness when I was younger and I didn't know any different, but now older muscle mass, you feel the asymmetries and you feel the differences. And that is where my level of awareness in my mind and my, my mindfulness practice I think kick started because I am just incredibly self aware of my body, but then that transcends into the awareness of thought, into the awareness of actions, and the awareness of others. And I, I do not think it's a coincidence that many athletes who have had that hold those characteristics as well. And I can see that in you. I can see that in your work. You've gone into well being work. You've gone into a lot of leadership work, and and that that need to help people stems from almost being able to lead yourself, understand yourself because then that yeah. can you can lead others through that that's yeah it's just something that i definitely keep picking up and you're aligning with that so so much very much very much so and i love the combination that both you and i have lewis is that um you know we've we've had a difference in our physicality that we've had to learn to to own and be proud of and love and and for me to be able to learn to lead that whole self everywhere I went you know it has been an incredible outcome at the same time it's I've also got that high performance that success outcome of of winning gold and 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 working out how to take um 
my performance to the best level I could. And so you, where I spend a lot of my time in the corporate world is, is helping people to lead themselves because I think it's come in a lot more now. Um, you know, most programs have a component of well-being or self-leadership. I've been in this space for 22 years and in the early days, you know, people didn't really think it or corporates didn't really think it was the responsibility of their organisation to develop their leaders in that sense, it was more like we'll add on the frameworks. Um, so it's been, you know, the leadership frameworks and, and not really help them lead themselves. But it's it's so wonderful where most of my work is helping leaders to lead themselves first and then to understand that if they can do that well, that ripple effect of being able to lead others um, is incredibly powerful. I think there's, you know, one book I read, um, I've, made, I've read many books, but I really like Bill George's book called True North. And Bill uh, is a lecturer out of Harvard. And, you know, he talks about that we all have, we all have a story, right? We, we all know um, mine's a bit more well known. And so is yours, Lewis, because our success as athletes, but everyone has a story. And um, he talks about, you know, your your times of difficulties or, cri- or crisis being like crucibles and which is that medieval sort of vessel in, that you would actually use to melt down different metals and then something out of it would transform. And he talks about that in leadership, if you don't deal with your own stories or your own crisis or your difficulties, they will come back to you at some point through someone else's story if you choose to be in leadership. And so, you know, as much as it's not, it's hard, it's hard to go in and and to navigate through that. Like for me to love and accept and take my whole self everywhere that took years you know it wasn't just like overnight it happened it took years of hard work and and you know professionals coming in to really help me power my best but what Bill talks about and what I know and what you would have seen is that people that actually spend the time to really understand and lead themselves become extraordinary leaders because of their their crucible moments and yeah and their learnings yeah, that ability to lead yourself first to then be able to lead others. It's putting your own oxygen mask on. It's taking care of your own house before you 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 help others. I'm very cautious of time, and I, I, I've probably got a couple of questions that I just wanted to ask around what you do for your own well-being right now. Not necessarily what you used to do, but probably what you do now, especially with around your your knowledge around this area. Yeah, so I haven't competed since 2006, I don't even want to run a personal best ever again. (laughs) I don't care about (laughs) time anymore. What I care about is moving. Um, I would move my body every day. Look, I love nature. I love walking. I love running. If I can get into nature, um, I've, you know, some of the big challenges I've set myself since um, being an athlete, I've walked Kokoda Track. I've trekked to the base of, or base camp of Everest, which is actually two thirds of the way up twice. Um, so I've really got into walking in nature. And one of my other faves is Bikram yoga. I, um, Ooh, yeah, cool. I love yoga. So um, I would do two or three classes a week of yoga. I find particularly Bikram for me about the first half an hour, if I'm busy, you know, I've had a busy day, my mind will be, you know, still wandering off to the day and to what I've got on tomorrow but about half an hour in you start a balancing set a balancing series and it's the same 26 postures each time and because my balance struggles already on my right side if I'm not present in the moment for those postures I fall over so I love the fact that when I get into Bikram about half an hour in I really do mindfulness at an incredible um, level because you can't do those poses if you're not present in the moment. So, um, yeah, uh, there are a couple of things I love doing. Yeah, that that exact reason is why I got into yoga, just being able to, through the physical practice of being able to uh, be present using the body, because that's what we as athletes connect with, because doing something like meditation and, my, uh, and just slow meditation practice was not what I wanted to do. I did not want to sit still. I want to do something. I want to feel my body. So it's a great, great way and a great uh, testimonial to being able to do something like that as an athlete to practice being present, even if it's just for 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, whatever it might be. It's a it's a work in progress. Um, look, you've, you've actually kind of answered one of my other questions, which was I always ask the guest to 
offer a recommendation of a book, a film, a quote, something like that. And you've you've gone into Brené Brown, you've gone into Bill George. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that. Um, if there's anything yeah. that you usually are always I... recommending people. Yeah, look, I will, um, Lewis. I I love um, acceptance commitment therapy. And, you, you know, you might have mentioned it throughout your podcast series. I'm not sure. Um, and there's a model in there called Psychological Flexibility uh, so one of my favourite books is um, it is by an Australian called, called Dr. Russ Harris. He wrote The Happiness Trap. He wrote The Reality Slap or The Confidence Gap. And even The Reality Slap is a good one to read right now because even though we're living in this pandemic, we're trying to get back to normal, but our reality keeps being moved by ever-changing things. So the model of psychological flexibility I learned about 12 years ago, it really helped me to, um, you know, to power my best. And I also do some work with the Australian Institute of Sport, helping their next level of gold medalists coming through through a program called, it was called Gold Medal Ready, it's now called Games um, Ready. And they brought together the you know best psychologists in Australia to come up with a framework, a psychological framework to really help mental performance. And they chose the psychological flexibility framework. So it's worth looking into. Um, so I'd read the happiness trap, the confidence gap, or the reality slap. <laughs> yeah, it's a, is that a coincidence they rhyme? <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, uh, well, look, pick one of them. They're all about the same thing. It's just whether you feel like you want more confidence or to really help with reality or, you, you know, to delve into happiness. But um, pretty much they're all, about, they're all around the same psychological theory of acceptance, commitment therapy, which is basically knowing what your values are and taking committed mm. action to your values and also having mindfulness as a practice so then when you're moving towards what's important and maybe you have a setback that you're able to use mindfulness to be able to diffuse from your thinking and you know when your thinking is saying you're not good enough you you know you're not going to win gold how do you you know diffuse from that and if you're experiencing any you know, painful feelings because you do when you're moving towards what's important in life that you don't give up when you feel frustration or sadness or anger that you're able to learn to be open to all of your feelings and experiences. So it's really aimed at getting you to accept and, you know, accept thoughts and feelings and commit to action based on your values, which is what we've talked about today. Yeah, amazing. (laughs) Uh, look, just finishing off, where, where's the best place to send people? Uh, where, where would where can people get in touch with you if they want to reach out? Yeah, katrinaweb.com.au is the best place. Uh, my website um, um, and check out all the different yeah, programs I run and uh, follow me on socials, which you can find off of my website. And yeah, that'd be great. Perfect. I'll put all the links in the show notes for this. Katrina, this has been a wonderful conversation. I thank you so much for for giving your time and being so open and honest and vulnerable about all of these areas. And and I think especially not only athletes, but the ability to self-accept and to, to have that value system in place to allow that to come out, I think is something that has shone through in this episode. And I, and I encourage people that are listening to to take some of that away from this and and into their own lives. So thank you so much for sharing. It's, it's been fantastic. My pleasure, Lewis. And I, I will just add, you know, it's been wonderful to win gold and I've loved my athletic career. I will say I found it hard to to match that feeling. I, ha- I found it hard to find something in life that matches that feeling. And I must say when along my journey um, I've come across young young people with cerebral palsy like me and I've got feedback that they then realize that they can be whoever they want to be and um, be the best version of themselves. That feeling to know that you've helped other people along their journey um, is a feeling that, you know, way surpasses that gold for me. So, um, yeah, it's special to know that when you, you know, prepared to lead yourself, you never really appreciate who's watching. And then when you find out that you can make a difference to others, that certainly gives you fuel to, to keep doing it. No doubt. Keep up the good work, Katrina. And uh, hopefully one day I'll be coming out to Adelaide. And, and, and if I am up in Birmingham when you're there, well, perhaps we'll come and I'll come and grab a coffee with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Take care.